Hello all and welcome to the first Sound Science Seminar of uh, 2021 and uh, welcome to 2021 for those of you just back from leave. I'm sorry for delaying this by a week but uh, it turned out there were still lots of people on leave and then we also had some ESCOM load shedding issues so we thought best to delay it to today. Um, today we are graced with the presence of Herr Dr. Professor Tony Swimmer who is the uh, the illustrious leader of the Ndlovu node, um, and he will be telling us about thickening of savannas with trees and shrubs. So um, I'll ask Tony to share his screen. Um, if I could ask the rest of you to please uh, stay muted and keep your cameras off just for connectivity issues and sound quality. Um, and if you have any questions, just start parking them in the, uh, in the chat window and we can ask them afterwards. If you have anything urgent that's kind of more clarity related and you feel Tony should explain it um, sooner rather than at the end, then just start it, prefix it with urgent um, and then I'll interrupt Tony and, and, and ask him that question. Cool, thank you very much. Take it away, Tony. Hi, thanks, Jasper. And morning to everyone and thanks for taking the time this morning to listen. Um, so I'm just going to give an overview of the number of research projects we've been working on um, related to this phenomenon of bush encroachment. Um, but first, I'm just going to give a brief overview of what it actually is and why it might matter. Um, and I just want to acknowledge up front that this, uh, what I'm going to show, involves the work of a lot of people, um, including many of our sound staff here at the Sound and Global Node, and uh, past and present staff and students as well. Um, so the, sorry, I'm just going to, bush encroachment um, is a pretty loose term that just refers to any increase in uh, trees or shrubs in a savanna or a grassland ecosystem, and it's been around a long time. As much as 100 years ago, farmers were already getting very concerned um, about this happening and taking up space where the grasses for the cattle or the sheep or their goats would grow. So the concern was an agricultural one and it was about decreased productivity. Um, and over the past hundred years, there's many, many examples where long-term photos, repeat photos provide a nice uh, record, a compelling record of, of how this structural change has occurred in so many parts of the world. Um, South Africa included, Southern Africa is actually one of the main areas where bush encroachment has been reported and studied. So here's just a few photos illustrating that this one uh, in color here is actually from Namibia and our stencil on contrast showing how land management can result in uh, bush encroachment. The one on the right is somewhere in the Eastern Cape uh, or Karoo actually um, and similar phenomenon over time. You can see it's a pretty slow process there um, but uh, happening over large areas there's some more examples from the Cape and Northern Cape, Eastern Cape, um, Eastern Cape again, just this time an aerial photo showing how widespread it can be. Um, there was a change in the air booklet that Sound produced a couple of years ago, um, which William Bond did or led, um, and that really had some nice examples and explained this phenomenon. And it's it's occurred um, from semi-arid Karoo systems all the way through to our highest uh, rainfall grasslands in the Drakensberg. Um, here's one closer to us, Marichkov Mountain, where Mesic savanna has just thickened up completely over the last 70 years. And from the far north of the country, here's the Sotpansberg, where it's been really extreme. Areas that were almost pure grass and are now so thick you can barely walk through them. And Tim O'Connor actually did a nice paper on this a few years ago, um, just giving an overview of the various um, reports of bush encroachment and how widespread it is uh, before he, he um, retired from Sion last year. And it's not only South Africa or Southern Africa, um, bush encroachment's been reported from around the world, wherever you basically have open systems, grasslands or savannas. And actually pretty much uh, probably better studied in the USA than in South Africa, actually. So what's been causing this? Um, you would think after 100 or more years of bush encroachment, we would know exactly what the problem is or what the cause is, but we don't actually. Um, fire is a, a definitely a, a major driver or lack of fire rather. So in many of the higher rainfall systems, regular fires would keep the trees and shrubs at bay, either preventing them from 
recruiting from making seedlings that grow into adults or just knocking back the adults or the young plants so that they never actually make it to the reproductive age. And with the replacement in a lot of areas of natural herbivores with livestock at higher densities, fire regimes have been disrupted over huge areas because the herbivores, the grazers eat all the grass and then there's nothing left to fuel the fires. And of course, there were direct impacts of herbivores in the past, um, browsers which were eating trees and shrubs and their seedlings and keeping them in check. Um, so these are the sort of traditional explanations, fire and herbivory disruption of natural fire and herbivory regimes. Uh, more recently, increasing atmospheric CO2 has been proposed as a mechanism. Um, and that's quite a complicated one, but uh, the argument is basically that with extra CO2, the trees and shrubs can grow faster, which allows them to recover better from being eaten or being burned by fire. Um, that's a favorite theory of William Bond, our, our former say on tooth scientist, and he's written a lot about that. Um, and then not as widely um, supported is the idea that changing rainfall regimes have also done this, uh, just because trees and shrubs can exploit a more, or in theory can exploit a more extreme rainfall regime than their competing grasses can. So a lot of potential causes, and it seems that in different systems, uh, these different drivers are important to different degrees, so it's quite messy. Okay, so does it really matter? I mean, we're not talking about massive desertification here or deforestation of global forests. We're just talking about some extra trees and shrubs that grow naturally in that area anyway. Well, I did mention the farmers were really concerned about it. So it has had massive impacts on range and productivity. And that's not only a consequence for livestock owners, but also ecotourism. So a lot of the game reserves, um, you know, it affects game viewing and there's a lot of concern about the impact that has on the game viewing experience and hence their revenues. There's also more recently a lot of concern about impact on biodiversity. There's a lot of species that are specialized for open systems, for grasslands or open savannas, and they get lost once the tree cover gets too thick. And then lastly, there's even more recently some interest in how bush encroachment could be affecting things at the scale of the whole globe. So earth system processes, particularly um, regulating CO2 levels and also actually impacting weather patterns. Um, so that, that sort of last point has got a lot of support from uh, a group who looked at when there were major changes in tree and shrub cover in the past. So about 15,000 years ago at the end of the Pleistocene area, um, paleoecologists have noted that there was a massive decline in the abundance of large uh, herbivores. So areas in North America, particularly in South America, but also Europe, um, shown in these different graphs here, these different lines, North America and South America saw a massive decline in the diversity of large animals. Europe, to a lesser degree, Africa, to an even lesser degree, Australia had quite a massive loss of all their big marsupials uh, a little bit earlier. This has been attributed to hunting as humans spread and became better hunters, um, with a lesser effect of climate, natural climatic changes occurring at that time. Uh, interestingly, the oceans were not affected, so the, the big mammals of the oceans haven't shown any decline at all. It's a phenomenon that only occurred on the land. Um, and these, the group studying this um, have speculated about all the consequences of the loss of these mega herbivores. Um, the main one being that, or the main theory being that with the loss of mega herbivores, there was a massive increase in trees and shrubs because these animals were keeping areas open through their massive consumption. Um, and there's a whole potential range of consequences that had for the planet. So this is, of course, this is stuff happening 10 to 15,000 years ago. Um, there's a whole lot of papers that have been written if you're interested. But basically the arguments are that, firstly, um, there was a cascading effect. So with the big herbivores gone and then the bush encroachment that occurred, it then led to a loss of a lot of smaller species that couldn't handle such thick cover of trees and shrubs. Uh, there's been some interesting ideas about how it would affect nutrient cycling, such as sodium, which is very, quite common in grasses and would um, start to cycle more slowly when trees take over. 
And then perhaps the most controversial is that this increase of trees would have led to a massive increase of leaf area, which would have led to reductions of global of CO2 in the atmosphere on a global scale, as well as other greenhouse gases such as methane. And they even argued that that might have even tipped the planet into one of the more recent ice ages. So anyway, the point of this is just simply that, at least from a theoretical point of view, uh, there are reasons to believe that widespread changes in the tree cover of savannas and grasslands could have consequences for the whole planet. Um, this, of course, has led to a recent uh, surge of interest and funding in increasing tree cover to draw down CO2 levels. So you, many of you have probably heard of the UN Decade of Restoration, which started a few years ago. We were in the middle of it now. Um, and this has prompted a whole lot of tree planting projects around the world. Um, at face value, it seems that this is to combat genuine deforestation, so tropical forests that have been cleared for agriculture and so on. But in fact, many of the target areas are in savannas and grasslands, um, in areas that we would say are not forest of any form and should actually be quite open. So um, while this is called a restoration project, it actually has left many of us wondering if it's not, if the actual goal is not just a, a means to uh, dispose of a whole lot of unwanted pollution pumped into the atmosphere by industrial nations over the last hundred years, uh, rather than a genuine attempt at restoring. Um, there was a, just a very recent article that came out this week about the, the renewed efforts to create the Great Green Wall on the edge of the Sahel in Northern Africa, Northwestern Africa. But when you look more closely, you see this picture in the bottom right, these areas that are meant to be planted up by millions of trees are actually sort of semi-arid savannas that we would consider to be naturally open systems. Um, this is just a Google Earth view of our part of the world is Kruger National Park. This is the Guiani area just north of Pelabora. And these lighter brown areas are areas of low tree cover. And you can see they occur both in Kruger and outside. So many of the people pushing the reforestation restoration projects would argue that these are actually degraded forests that should be all green and covered in trees. Whereas we consider them, or similarly I do, and I think most uh, ecologists working in African savannas would actually consider them to be even more tree than they should be. They're considered to be bush encroached and the brown colors are really a result of degradation of the herbaceous layer of the grasses and the grazing of the grasses rather than a lack of trees. Okay, so that's why we're so interested in bush encroachment. Um, so we've set up over the last uh, so 12, 13 years, um, we're trying to be either support or do research that could firstly give us a better idea of what has caused bush encroachment in the past and what is continuing to cause it, and then get a better understanding of the consequences. Um, and I'm just gonna go over a couple of these projects now and give you um, some of the key results. All of this work is taking place right up in the northeastern part of South Africa, mostly in Mpopo, just kind of within range of our headquarters in Pelabora. Um, so there's a very long, old, long-term old experiment in the Kruger National Park called the Experimental Burn Plots, um, which was set up in the 1950s because the managers of the park were concerned about how often the park was burning and they wanted to try to determine what an appropriate burning regime would be for the park. So they set up a number of large plots, about seven hectares with various burning treatments. And fortunately they did some baseline vegetation surveys. And those have been repeated over the years, either by the, the Kruger Park Scientific Services staff or by outside researchers. And they provide a nice long-term record of uh, changes in woody cover um, and the impact of different burning regimes on that, um, on that tree and shrub cover. And actually, um, that data has been used to argue that there's a CO2 fertilization effect. In other words, that Kruger has been coming thicker because of increased atmospheric CO2. But when I was looking at one of the recent publications, um, it struck me that if you look at the measure of tree density there, it's at many, at one of the sites, it's actually been declining since the experiment was set up in the 1950s. And at another, it increased dramatically, but then over the, the previous decade, 
around, say, nine, uh, the 2000s, um, 2000 to roughly 2010, it looked like either there was a decrease or at least there was no more increases. So um, we then were partnered with Kruger Park to go and resample again to get another point on this long-term time series and just work out what exactly was going on. Um, so we worked, so this is real good old fashioned field work, finding old plots and remarking them and measuring all the trees and shrubs that are present. And what we found was a similar pattern. So at the driest site, um, which is in the Wapani Felt, it's in the top left pane here, we saw that the long-term trend really is for a decrease in trees. And that can be explained simply by the increase in elephants. Um, so elephants were nearly exterminated from the low felt uh, at the end of the um, 1800s, uh, and then began to recolonize over the 1900s. And by the end of the last century, by the 2000s, they were really getting to high densities. And I think what we're seeing here is just the impact of elephants as they return to sort of former densities. Um, as you move up in rainfall from one site to the next, uh, that effect becomes weaker. So for example, the Spikusa site, which is about 150 millimeters per year more than the Mapani site, we see some plots are declining, but some are actually increasing in their tree cover. And then at the wetter site, which is Pretorius Cop or Peacock here, we see that regardless of the burning regime, so each different line there in a different color is a different burning treatment, a different uh, unit of the experiment. Um, and even with annual burning, it seems that cover is going up, or the plant density is going up, which is a, a bit concerning because you would think even um, in a system of this rainfall that annual burning would be more than sufficient to keep it open. Um, and also the elephants there, why are they not keeping it open? So that certainly does suggest that uh, there's another factor at play and atmospheric CO2 would be the logical explanation. Although you cannot rule out other things, I mean, these processes are very slow processes. All these trees grow very slowly. So we could actually be seeing lag effects from disturbance in the earlier times or from the absence of elephants for a while. There might still be a massive multi-decadal lag effect going on. Uh, we just can't say at this stage. Uh, here's another smaller study done in a similar area to the Pretorioscope one. So the site where trees are increasing regardless of fire, this is just near to it with a very similar climate, uh, almost a day, oh, it's actually really right next door. So it's the same conditions. But here we went and resampled plots uh, that had been done inside and outside the park uh, by an MSC student about uh, nearly 20 years ago. So after a 10 year break, we resampled them and we wanted to see if we've seen the same increasing trends along a variety of different land uses. So here we have not only elephants and fire in Kruger, but we also have no, elef no elephants and very little fire um, outside. Um, and again, this is mostly done by our staff, um, many hours of field work. And what we found that uh, in, in the more disturbed environment outside in the rural rangelands, we did indeed see an increase in, uh, in the, uh, the abundance of trees and shrubs. Uh, and we looked at the sites within Kruger Park and we did see that in some parts of the landscape, but not in others. So in lowlands, the areas closest to little rivers, there was an increase. But on the upper slopes and the crests, there was actually a decrease. Um, so that was an intriguing clue into causes. Um, obviously, there's not one ubiquitous cause happening right across the, the broader landscape. So uh, we, we need to do more research to understand why some areas are actually starting to open up again. Um, and if you look at this broken down by height class, we see it's sort of intermediate sized trees that are, uh, that were becoming less abundant. So perhaps that is just the effect of elephants slowly starting to manifest now, because that is sort of the height class that they feed at. Okay, moving on to another study uh, looking at herbivores and specifically elephants. So I did mention uh, in the first case study that um, at the Mapani site of the EBPs, there was a decrease in the, the, the abundance of woody plants at that site. And this is another site nearby called the Lataba Exclosure. So this was set up in a, a semi-arid Mapani felt environment. Um, specifically, it was by a big American funded group um, in around 2000, specifically to look at the role of mega herbivores and particularly elephants. And that was done just by excluding them from big blocks. So there were two big um, exclosures, one fully fenced like that, which excludes 
all herbivores, anything uh, from a rabbit up to an elephant. Um, and then one a second treatment, which was a partial, which was intended to keep elephant and giraffe out, which is higher strands, but would allow smaller animals species to move in and continue. So that was an attempt to disentangle the effect of the mega herbivores from the other herbivores. Um, and what we found here recently, so we partnered with Northwest University here and Sandpox um, Scientific Services just to resurvey some of the baseline stuff they had done. And we actually found here in our control areas, so outside these fences where you have a natural herbivore regime, there has been a slow and steady increase um, in the abundance of woody plants of trees and shrubs which was quite surprising and, and not the same pattern we saw in the other study. Um, and a similar thing, but uh, a bit more jumpy, a bit more variable, but where we excluded all the, all the herbivores, even then a slight increase. And interestingly, we, we excluded just the large herbivores, so just the elephant for this case, um, we saw really big increases. So this suggests again, multiple causes. Elephants will seem to be playing a role, but it seems that them on their own is not enough to stop bush encroachment happening here. Again, these are very slow systems. Um, you know, this is, these are studies that are only 16 years apart between the first and the last bar. Um, so again, there's potential for lag effects happening here. And um, this is the type of experiment you really wanna keep going for many, many decades. Okay, uh, an example from a very different ecosystem now, the other extreme of our kind of environmental range here. So this is up on the escarpment near the town of Zanin. Um, there's a very uh, high diversity grassland near the town of Heinitzburg. Um, as with so much of this area, uh, montane grassland along the escarpment has been converted to plantations, um, gum and pine trees. Um, with just small patches left in between, and the occurrence of all these plantations has severely disrupted the natural fire regimes, as well as whatever herbivory regimes were there in the past. Um, so we've been looking at this site um, to try and understand if fire alone can keep these really threatened and, and diverse grassland ecosystems as grasslands. Um, so this is a lot of work done by, or led by Dave Thompson and other staff. Um, and he set up uh, um, some permanent monitoring plots back in 2009 in different parts of this grassland and they burn at different frequencies. So here's just an example um, in that top left pane showing that if a grassland is burnt once every three years, there was a massive increase in the cover of shrubs. But if they were burnt every year, there was just a negligible increase. Um, so fire, clearly an important factor here and it seems like it might be enough to keep these grasslands as grasslands going into the future, but we're not sure. Another nice result coming out here uh, in the pane on the right-hand side is that uh, showing that in plots with high woody cover, the number of herbaceous species, so these are grass and fall sort of flowering species, is, is much reduced. So that's just showing the, the negative consequence of bush encroachment at the site. Um, and we currently have a PDP student, Marlies Muller, who's working with our latest data from here and is gonna be looking more closely um, at these changes in, in the diversity of the herbaceous layer. And that will hopefully be a, a topic for a seance seminar later in this year or next year. Okay, um, another project looking more at the consequences than the causes. Uh, and this has been done led by Melissa Smith, who was a postdoc recently with us and Keenan Steers is currently a postdoc. Uh, along the edge of Kruger National Park, there's a lot of private game reserves and they take their game gene very seriously and a lot of them have undertaken bush clearing, mechanical bush clearing, so just cutting out trees by hand, sometimes by tractor, um, in order to keep their reserves more open and their game gene better. Um, here's an example of a rather extreme application of this method. Um, this is one of the game reserves close to Kruger and you can see his strips along roads here. This is where they cleared almost every single um, tree and shrub. I think their policy was to leave only trees taller than five meters and there's not many. Um, and then that contrasts quite sharply with the, the non-cleared areas which are really quite thick. So what Melissa and Keenan have done, um, they've used this as a natural experiment and they've found areas um, with a variety of, of tree cover as well as these um, 
very open areas. And I looked at how that's affecting the ecosystem and particularly um, the abundance of, of large herbivores, um, which of course was the intention of, of the, the clearing. Um, and so you would expect that the grazers would do better in these very open areas that's depicted here on the left because there's a lot of grass and there's not too many trees and they don't like too many trees because they can't see their predators, lion and leopard and cheetah, etc. if things are too thick. Uh, whereas obviously your species that depend upon trees and shrubs for their food, the browsers, would be, should be more abundant in the thicker stuff. And maybe your mixed feed is more abundant in the middle. Um, so they found they did a many, many hours and days of game drives through these areas recording well, I shouldn't call them game drives, I suppose it's research, but recording the abundance of herbivores by site just by driving uh, around these areas. And they've done this in the wet season, in summer and the dry season. And they found that an intermediate cover is really the best as, as far as herbivory is, is concerned. You get your most species visiting these areas of intermediate cover, um, both in, in wet and dry times. Um, and you get a higher abundance of them overall. So too many trees and shrubs is bad for herbivores, but also too few in these savanna systems. And here's another example um, of uh, tree cover affecting herbivore abundance. So this is now from a much drier site. This is north of Palabora in a community owned game reserve called Umtumkulu. And this is adjacent to the Kruger Park and it's open to the Kruger Park. So it has a, a full suite of, of natural herbivores. But it is very thick Mopani felt. And so in partnership with the owners um, and, and uh, the K2C Biosphere um, in here, we've set up a project where we've been able to clear some plots and we're contrasting them with the, the control areas, thick areas next door to try and see what that does. Um, so we've taken areas that kind of look like this. It's like two meter tall Mopani felt, very thick and converted it into areas that look like this. Um, where we've left only trees taller than four meters. Um, and we've partnered, well, uh, partnering with K2C, we've been able to do regular measurements um, of grass composition and productivity and animal abundance. Uh, we use dung counts for animal abundance, looking at the number of dung piles of different species. Um, so first of all, what we found um, in these cleared plots is that it does result in a big increase in grass production. Um, that might seem obvious to many because there's other uh, studies that have shown this as well, but there is a lot of concern, um, particularly amongst managers, that if you do clear trees, you're actually going to reduce the abundance of your grass because there's an the idea that trees actually help the grass by shading them in such a hot and dry area. But the fact is, well, it would seem that um, competition for water is a much bigger factor. So we hypothesize that when you remove these trees, there's just more water left over for the grasses and that's why you're having this higher grass production. Um, this is just shown three separate, the results for three separate plots over three years um, and almost without fail, so for one exception, there has been higher grass production where the trees were cleared. And here's an example of some of our dung count data and this is just showing that herbivore abundance did increase in these plots where we cleared the trees. So those are the blue bars there, uh, the red bars being the controls. So, at least for grazing species, um, here hippo and polar water as water by the zebra, they do like these open areas more, as you would expect. Uh, what about other species? The browsers are being negatively affected, perhaps. Um, and we did find some species. So the bar on the left is showing species where the abundance of dung is less in the, the cut plots, the cleared plots, relative to the control ones. Um, and there were a couple of species that did become less common. But there were more species that became more common in the cut areas at the bar on the right. So overall a net increase in your herbivore diversity and abundance. All right then just to end off, um, one uh, fairly new project that's going on at the same site in the same plots. Um, this has been done, been led by Michelle Tisha from um, a, a hydrology scientist at um, Grass and Wetland Forests, and it's actually part of a national scale project. Um, we've been, or she's been setting up sites together with other partners around the country um, so that we can get a, an idea of the impact of uh, increasing trees and shrubs on the, on the water cycle. So I think that's a really relevant um, question 
particularly for South Africa with our water shortages. Um, there's been really a lot of research on bush encroachment impacts on animals and other species, but not really on the supply of water. Uh, we know it, at least from our high altitude, high rainfall areas that afforestation plantations do reduce stream flow a lot. But would bush encroachment over massive areas, much bigger than those uh, high altitude areas, would that also have an impact? Um, so we're trying to get at that. And this is a, just a setup of surface renewal stations that's been done um, by Tiffany Oldworth for her PhD. And that will hopefully be a, another presentation when she has finalized her results um, soonish. Uh, but this is trying to understand that the impacts of clearing trees in a dry area, does it result in more soil moisture and ultimately would that result in, in stream flow in a regional scale? All right, so to end off, um, I've given you quite a mixed bag of uh, projects and results there. And I think the key message is that it's, there really are no clear answers for causes and consequences of bush encroachment in our South African savannas. Um, there's various studies we, that um, it's clearly um, very context dependent and uh, different different consequences and different causes in different parts of the country and at different times. Um, so we really do need to get a better grip of that, at least for the consequences. Um, we know about impacts on some components of biodiversity, but there's many others, uh, such as birds and invertebrates, where the impacts are not really that well known. Um, I've mentioned water, and we really do need to show if it is true that there's serious consequences uh, of bush encroachment for water supply. If they are, that's obviously strong motivation for keeping or for combating mitigation bush encroachment. And then, of course, if there are consequences for the global scale, then that's important too. And a lot of research still needs to be done there. Does bush encroachment really result in a decrease in atmospheric CO2? Um, I would imagine it's a negligible effect and it can even have the opposite effect in many systems um, where you actually find that your soil organic carbon is lower in bush encroach systems. Um, and there's also another an, a variety of other mechanisms um, by which bush encroachment could be affecting uh, global weather systems, um, such as changes in albedo and changes in evapotranspiration and um, various other complicated things like the uh, boundary resistance of the surface layer and so on. So a need for some really um, detailed uh, hydrometeorological hydro studies there. And then of course, the final big question is how do we keep open systems, open savannas and grasslands open in the future? So uh, William Bond, our, our recently retired um, scientist, chief scientist has just written a book on this if you're interested. Um, but it's, um, it's critical that we understand how the ongoing increase in atmospheric CO2 is affecting these systems. And we need to really um, combat this paradigm that uh, all these systems are degraded forests that need to be have even more trees and shrubs that they currently do. And of course, we need to understand more extreme rainfall, particularly in the drier systems where fire is not important. Um, what are the effects of extreme floods and droughts um, for recruitment of, of these species? Okay, so I'm going to end off with that, um, with those questions, and um, I'll be happy to Take any questions from you now. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, no one's parked any questions in the uh, in the chat box yet, so feel free to fire away. Otherwise, if you would like to ask a question directly, you're welcome to raise your hand, and uh, I'll invite you to unmute yourself and and, and ask the question. Um, I suppose from my side, there's like a, I don't know if it's a moral question or, a, or just a desperation question, but you know, given that there's sites that it seems that even if we manage the fire and herbivory regimes, they're still, in, um, still thickening up, you know, should we be doing mechanical clearing? You know, it seems like that, that, that game reserve, the private game reserve is playing a bit of a Disneyland game there, but, uh, 
yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no, I'm sure there's no straight answer for, for everywhere, you know, but, uh, but in some sites, I suppose you would need to, in other sites not, but. but. Yeah, I think, um, I think there's going to be a need for that in a lot of areas. Um, I mean, there could be just plain hysteresis effects where an absence, absence of uh, fire and or herbivory for a while shifts it into a bush and trade state and that same level of fire and herbivory cannot shift it back because it's an alternate stable state. Yeah. Um, and in that case, yeah, you would have to do something extra, like mechanical shearing, to flip it back. Um, and I think, uh, especially in a lot of wetter areas where it's happened fast and where it's been thick for a long time, um, and for example, maybe you've lost populations of grass species or, or seed banks and stuff, that's probably, you know, probably going to be required. And I think it already has been. I think a lot of Farmers have realized that, so it's not in the scientific literature, but I think there's been, um, you know, a lot of attempts to open systems by burning alone that have failed, and mm. so the guys are now clearing. And um, and and that particular site where they where they did that mechanical clearing, do they do follow up clearing, or are you able to monitor uh, to what extent it's staying open, or if it's just thickening up again? Yeah, they do follow up there. Um, they do actually annual follow that so they put a lot of effort into it i mean it's a, it's a very expensive yeah. management strategy too yeah. but there are numerous other areas around here where it's been cleared um and they might have followed up for a few years and now they're not anymore and you do see thickening happening again starting yeah. to you know yes, that's interesting. and i think now with the collapse of the game farm prices because a lot of the clearing has been done on game farms yeah. So it's basically been funded by the sales of game for hunting. Yeah. Um, and those prices have collapsed as this less money available for clearing now. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like interesting tests with the you know, to test how far you have to knock it to overcome the hysteresis, but it almost seems like you can't. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, these trees are such strong sprouters, you know, they can be cut numerous times and um they just hang in there underground and, and can come back. At that Imtum Kulu site, we've just been cutting, we haven't been poisoning. So the, the Mapani trees get cut three or four times a year. And I think our latest result is about 30% about, um, mortality of the four years of repeated cutting like that. So once they're established, they can really hang in there for a long time. Uh, to take a beating. <laughs> um, so Rob, Skelton has a question here. Um, thanks, Tony. Great presentation. I had a question with regard to the Kruger study results. My understanding of what you mentioned is that high rainfall mitigates the impacts of herbivores, and this is why you see the CO2, of, CO2 effects. Is that correct? Um, well, uh, possibly. So there is. Um, so that first statement there that high rainfall mitigates impact of herbivores. Now that could be in itself the reason. I mean, it, for a given level of elephant damage, it might be that the trees uh, populations can maintain or even increase. Um, and so you'd have to have higher elephant impact rates than in the drier systems. That's quite possible. Um, but it's also possible that see that the, the trees are able to take advantage of the higher CO2 under in higher rainfall systems, um, which then yeah, helps them cope better with herbivory or fire, whatever. Um, that's kind of counterintuitive because CO2 fertilization effects are supposed to be strongest where there's you know, water shortages because it helps with water use efficiency. Um, but it's not that simple. Um, so I think there is, a, there is potential there because even though this is a wetter system, it's still relatively dry compared to systems where a lot of CO2 work has been done in, in temperate forests and so on. So I think that mechanism you're talking about there is, is definitely possible. Um, and then Gina's got a good one here. You mentioned uh, long-term changes in rainfall as a potential driver, but then you didn't really discuss it in any way. Um, Gina was just asking if there are any data to kind of... Yeah, okay. um, So the, I, I know of one study that was done in Shishlu and Pelosi and KZN. Um, and I think, I can't remember who that was. I have a feeling it was actually Paul from, from um, Grass and Rich and Forest. Um, 
where there was the long-term records do correlate um, with an increase in bush encroachment, so increasing in rainfall or some metric of rainfall. Um, I can't think of any other studies, and really I don't think there are very many where there's some sort of um, attempt to directly relate changes in rainfall to cover. But there's a couple of more mechanistic studies where they've shown that changes in rainfall regime will increase soil moisture depth and that the trees have more roots at depth, and so you can infer they'll do better. Um, there's been some of that in Kruger and some of that overseas, I think, in the US as well. So um, nothing conclusive, but again, you know, some, some pretty sound theoretical um, mechanisms for why that would happen. Um, we have a question here from Ted Woods asking, should bush clearing be selective and limited to specific species such as Dicostacus? Yeah, um, so I think the answer to that depends on your objectives for bush clearing. Um, if you're doing it for more for range and productivity, then maybe not. You might just want to get a very open system or if you're doing it for game viewing specifically. Um, but of course, if you're doing it for biodiversity overall, then sure, you just want to remove the species that have encro encroached the most and, and restore some sort of uh, more even abundance of the various tree species. Um, yeah, so it depends why you're doing it, I think is the answer to that. Um, and then a question from Tim Hoffman, um, who says, thanks for the presentation and the lovely photos of bush encroachment taken by James Puttick and others at the PCU. Um, he is asking about, uh, so you talked about bush encroachment in the savannah biome, but what is your sense of the rate of expansion um, into the formerly kind of pure grassland areas? Um, okay, thanks, Tim. So I think you, um, Tim, you're just pointing out that I'm, I neglected to acknowledge those opening photos. I, know I meant to actually, but um, a lot of those are from who he mentions and also that great re-photo website that you may have seen where a lot of these photos are available. Um, yeah, so they're a great resource, I think, for not only for talks, but for getting, um, yeah, well, for getting students interested in this phenomenon. Um, so I don't know, Tim, um, you know, I'm not that familiar with the rate of expansion of woody plants into pure grasslands, but from what I've seen, um, it's more severe than in savannas. But I would guess that if we looked at it by rainfall rather than by biome type, we would get a similar thing. I mean, the wetter, more productive areas have thickened up faster than the dry areas. That's my sense of it, but I'm not really sure. And I'm sure there's also going to be, you know, other factors there, such as soil nutrients and soil depth that regulate that, that rate of encroachment. Um, I'll hit you with one last one. But is there any, um, you know, so, so the, the rates of bush encroachment, as you say, vary with rainfall and uh, nutrient status of the soils and that kind of thing. Is there any uh, indication of, of impacts on soil nutrient status that are driving changes? So, so human impacts on soil nutrient status potentially driving changes, like atmospheric deposition, nitrogen, that kind of thing? Um, not that I know of. Um, Perhaps something has been done in the US. I mean, I know there are, well, there's studies going the other way showing, you know, like sulfur deposition, acid rain, slowing tree growth rates. Um, and so would that be happening here? Or would there even be a fertilization effect? And I, I really don't know, actually. I don't, you know, many of these areas where it's been studied and where there's concern about it are, are obviously big range and farming areas or game reserve areas. So there's not much position happening you're not close to a big industrial center hmm. but that would be oh, i mean it would be a really interesting one to look at hmm. cool well then i think barring any further questions we should probably leave it there um thank you everyone for attending i will be loading this um presentation onto the sound uh, youtube channel um, where you can also find the previous seminars um, in this series. There's been five to date. Um, I'll just post the link so you can find, find them.
Um, but I'll be uploading this seminar um, in the next hour or so, and uh, and I'll share it with the email list that, that I've got. So as many of you, I see, must have got, got this forwarded to you. So please, for those who did forwarding, please forward the link, um, and then you can share this presentation with others who, who may be interested. Thanks very much, Tony. And uh, welcome to 2021, everyone, and I hope you have a productive year. Great, and thanks for organizing again, Jasper. Cool, no worries. Try and work out how to stop the recording.